Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, wherever you are. My name is Michel Goldman. I'm the co-director, together with Mathias de Watripon, of the Institute for Interdisciplinary Innovation in Healthcare, so-called I3H, at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Thank you so much for joining us to follow this conference debate, organized as part of our interdisciplinary educational program. A program that gathers students from different backgrounds, but sharing a common interest in health. This conference debate was organized for them, but also for all of you who are wondering how we will come out of this crisis. At this time, most of our hopes rely on the deployment of efficient and safe vaccines, as you know. With a number of vaccine trials currently ongoing, we saw that it is the appropriate time to discuss what we can expect in coming months, actually not only from vaccine, but also from other immunological medicines. Before giving the floor to Vanessa Costanzo, who will be our moderator, I would like to express my warmest thanks to the Delen Private Bank, who is our unique partner for this conference, and of course to our guest speakers who accept to join us on short notice. Vanessa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michel. Good morning, uh, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon to all our speakers. Uh, it is so good to meet you for the first, uh, the third time, and also for the first time after uh, lockdown exit. After looking at COVID-19 systemic crisis, after considering how to mobilize collective intelligence in Europe, the time has come to talk about vaccine and therapeutic antibodies. As usual, you have the possibility to ask questions to our speakers. As in previous conferences, we wish to address questions and discuss issues on the basis and only on the basis of scientific facts. We are here neither to promote any company nor to bash anyone or any concept. So please formulate your questions accordingly. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Before addressing vaccines, uh, the topic of today, let's start with the other immunological medicine that Michel alluded to. Michel Kazachkin, uh, uh, good afternoon. You have Hello. been the executive director of the Global Fund uh, to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. That's the third time you actually are uh, with us uh, joining the, the video conferences and you are currently uh, advocating for more attention to antibodies uh, dedicated to treat COVID-19. Could you please let us know why and how these medicines differ from vaccines? Yes, thank you, Vanessa. Um... To answer your question, and since I'm the first speaker this afternoon, I, let me just first very briefly set the landscape of the interventions we currently have or hope to have for COVID-19. One, as everyone knows, is physical distancing and protective equipment, PPE, that is basically masks. Although no one of these interventions, distancing or masks, will provide complete protection. There's now very good and strong evidence that um, each of them can reduce by up to 80%, 80% the risk of infection in both healthcare settings and in the community. Then antiviral medicines. As people listening would know, little progress has been made in that area. Uh, dexamethasone and remdesivir, two drugs, have been shown to reduce mortality in patients with severe COVID-19 disease, but no other drug so far has proven to be effective. Third, vaccines, which will be uh, discussed extensively this afternoon. And this obviously is a global priority to break transmission and to getting control of the epidemic. The aim of vaccination, I mean, everyone knows that, but it's worth stating so that there's no confusion between vaccines and therapeutic antibodies. The aim of vaccination is to induce a protective immunity in people who have not been infected by the virus. Uh, many of the vaccines in development as we will discuss, 
aim at specifically inducing what we call neutralizing antibodies that would block the ability of the virus to bind to and to enter host cells. However, generating such antibodies is not enough. And again, as I'm sure we will discuss, we need uh, to demonstrate that these induced antibodies provide protection from infection, that they're safe, and that the protection they provide is, is durable. And finally, antibodies. Antibodies to prevent and to treat COVID-19. The difference uh, between this approach and vaccination is that the antibodies are not produced by yourself, as it would be the case if you are to be vaccinated, but they're produced by immunizing animals. And here we have horses, we have llamas, we have strange uh, constructs that I, I won't go into the detail of, or they're produced by bioengineering uh, in the case of monoclonal antibodies. The advantage of antibodies is that as they are administered to someone, they provide immediate immunity. Whereas when you vaccinate, you have to wait for the vaccinated person to produce the antibodies. So they provide immediate immunity. The challenge is that the immunity will be short-lived, maybe three weeks or so. And there are still a number of challenges when it comes to manufacturing, to cost and to scalability of the intervention. However, that science is advancing full speed. Uh, I'm fairly optimistic that we will have such antibodies before the end of year 2020. And I believe they are, uh, and they will be precious tools as we prepare for a second wave and we have to prepare for a second wave before we have a vaccine. They will be useful to treat, for example, early treatment of people at the onset of symptoms. They may also prove efficient in prevention. For example, imagine I'm a vulnerable person person, and actually I am, I'm over 65, and I come in contact with, with uh, in someone infected, I get a, a, a sort of preventative shot uh, of, of antibody. So that's the picture. Uh, hope I have answered your question, Vanessa. Thank you, Michel. Uh, Nathalie Garçon, uh, you are uh, the CEO and the Chief Exec uh, scientific, uh, scientific Officer of uh, BioAster, uh, the French Technology Research Institute for Infectiology and Microbiology. Media uh, talks a lot about vaccines, less about antibodies. Why is it so? Are they more difficult or most uh, to produce or are they uh, more costly also? Natalie, are you there with us? She has yes, I am. Ah, okay. <laughs> no, I did am. you hear my question? I did, yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm just going to complete what was said uh, earlier. The, the big difference between vaccines and uh, anti-monoclonal or therapeutic uh, antibodies is one is active, you produce your own antibodies, the other one is passive. What it means is that uh, it's faster, as it was said, the response is faster, but you need to give more. You need to give more and you need usually to give more, more often, which means that you need to have uh, a production capacity, which is uh, fairly different from the vaccine. And if you want to make a parallel, uh, a lot of vaccines are based on the same uh, principle of production, which is... Uh, protein antigen in the case of uh, COV-2. And this is the same process, same principles, same tools, same, same quality control, but the amount that you need is uh, logarithmically higher for uh, immunotherapy, especially in the context of COVID where uh, a lot of people may be infected and that's where you want to intervene. Once people are infected, you can eliminate the virus through antiviral and today there's not that many, or you can eliminate the virus by providing the antibody that will eliminate the virus that you have been infected with. So you need to give it as early as possible and as at the 
sufficiently high doses that uh, you will impact on, on its replication. So it's not production per se, because as, as Michel said, the, the bioprocessing has improved a lot during the last decade and continues. It's more the amount that you will need to produce and not only the amount, but the speed at which you will need to produce it. So you have the prophylactic aspect of the vaccine, you, your own body is producing the antibody or you have the therapeutic approach where you do have to produce them and uh, that takes time and that takes a lot of uh, amount of those to be able to have an effect. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, Michel Goldman, when antibodies will be available, you recommend using them also for asymptomatic patients. I think the, the problem we have with this virus is, the, is that indeed a high number of infected people do not develop symptoms. And even if they develop symptoms, they will transmit the virus before they present these symptoms. So if we want to intervene early and really to break this uh, chain or the, the viral transmission chain, it's very important not only to put people in quarantine, which is what we do now, but if we can rapidly act on those getting the virus, even without symptoms, this will certainly have a beneficial effect. You mean if you come back from a, a what we call now a, a red zone uh, from a vacation, uh, you could get this in the injection before you get sick no, or you, you have to be tested before? Yeah. Okay. Just to make sure. First, and I think that now that we have probably certain less people infected, it's probably in these circumstances that this type of therapies can be useful to prevent a significant second wave, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michel. Uh, let's now um, focus on vaccine, but maybe I will ask him a question. Uh, Rino Rapuoli, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you are in Italy uh, and uh, you are the head of uh, external R&D at uh, GSK Vaccines. And you are also a professor of vaccine research at Imperial College in London. You have created many vaccines and you are the father of reverse vaccinology uh, that has revolutionized a revolutionized, I think today I have a problem <laughs> with the, <laughs> to revolutionize the field. Uh, so Reno, before we um, jump on vaccines, maybe a question about um, uh, antibodies, because I heard someone uh, say that immunity could last for a couple of weeks, but now we have probably much more information about that. How long will, um, um, will last this immunity? Do you already know that? Um, yeah, I would say that the, um, I, I share what has been said so far. I think human monoclonal antibodies are a real tool uh, uh, that should be used for prevention and for therapy of uh, COVID-19. Uh, the, I mean, so far, uh, human monoclonal antibodies have not been used mostly for cancer or immunity, not much for infectious diseases. But I bet uh, that human monoclonal antibodies will be the first therapy for uh, COVID-19. Now, the uh, beauty today is that you can engineer the one day, you can engineer their uh, so that the uh, immunity can last much longer. So we can engineer the antibodies to have a half-life of more than 90 days. And so today it's possible to get uh, human monoclonal antibodies that will provide protection up to six months. Uh, and actually, we are uh, in my laboratory. We are uh, developing human monoclonal antibodies, uh, and we found very powerful ones that we believe will be very useful uh, in the next few months. When do we get them? Do you know? Can you tell us when they will be on the market? Well, Not yet. I don't know on the market, uh, but uh, there will be clinical trials uh, in the next few months. And there are some uh, monoclonal antibodies by other companies that are already in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's get back to uh, the vaccines. Um, 
isn't it the first time, uh, Reno, that big pharma, I mean, pharmaceutical companies everywhere collaborate so intensely? Usually your market is seen and it is a very competitive one. It looks like here companies decided to choose their allies to stack all the odds in their favor. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's um, obviously it's a special moment for uh, for the world for uh, we never experienced before such a such a pandemic and the approach has been really collaborative uh, the companies the governments the regulatory authorities uh, i mean the approach has not been what's the best way to make profit but has been how can we contribute to uh, basically control this pandemic and that has been the main motivation uh, and the internally, I mean, when we saw this pandemic coming, uh, we asked the question, uh, should we do our vaccine or should we try to do something very special uh, that could help the world to do a better, uh, to, I mean, to have a, be a better solution for the pandemic. And so we decided not to do our internal vaccine, but basically, to provide our adjuvant, which is unique, to um, many, uh, to all the companies or research groups worldwide that were interested in making a vaccine. So they will not make one vaccine, but will enable to make many vaccines in many continents, Asia, China, Australia, Europe, and North America. And so uh, it's been really uh, beautiful uh, to, to see that really the companies and the everybody was trying to collaborate to solve the problem and that was the main uh, I mean, the main spirit of all the interactions that we had mm -hmm. thank you uh, Mathias de Watripon uh, hello you are in Brussels um, you are one of the co-directors of uh, i3h institute professor of economics and former vice governor, vice governor of the national bank of belgium recently you have been appointed by the belgian government to be part of the team of experts handling the crisis here in belgium of course matthias uh, public health is crucial in this debate we know that but talking about vaccines also means uh, talking about finding a solution to avoid a worldwide uh, recession or a deepest worldwide recession, should I say? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Well, thank you. Thanks to everybody who is uh, either speaking or listening to, to this. So it's great. Um, yes, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, the economic impact of uh, COVID-19, well, First of all, of course, a lot of the bad impact uh, is happening right now uh, and uh, at a time where we don't have a vaccine yet. Uh, there is in, in some areas, there is a bit of a rebound already. Uh, of course, so there is a lot of uncertainty about uh, whether a, uh, a rebound of the epidemic uh, will take place. Of course, there are some places where the epidemic is still growing and somewhere it was going down a little bit and it's again growing like in, in the US. So, uh, but let's say if you think about Europe, I think that we are learning uh, a bit uh, the, uh, what the Asians had learned, uh, East Asians, uh, about uh, these kinds of things. And so my hope is that uh, the, uh, we have improved in a way to to uh, manage the crisis without a, a vaccine so that uh, the lockdown will be much more targeted in the future and uh, less costly economically. So in that sense, I think uh, the uh, part of the, um, the economic learning has taken place. On the other hand, of course, uh, a vaccine could be a game changer provided uh, it is uh, a kind of a miracle cure uh, if it is a uh, like some flu vaccine that works 70% of the time, uh, I think at that point it would be definitely helpful, but it will be only one tool in the toolbox, and uh, we still need mass testing and the like. Uh, and so one thing I mean I think it would be interesting to discuss is not only how fast could a vaccine come or vaccines come, but also how 
uh, efficient they would be at really uh, stopping the, the epidemic. Um, because I think for the, uh, for the uh, economic prospects, uh, I think a vaccine that works 70% of the time is, uh, means that the virus would still be around, possibly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nathalie Garçon, um, you, my first question will be based on, on, on timing. Um, it is, uh, this fight against COVID-19 has shortened even compressed timelines. Uh, when it comes to vaccine, people usually talk about 10 years research, testing, and then approval. How is it possible now to make everything, to concentrate everything in a few months? Let's focus on trial maybe and uh, regulatory uh, approvals. Let's, let's yes. just start with that. But to talk about that, I think you have to realize that actually the time saved is before clinical trial and regulatory. When you when you develop a vaccine, you first you have to establish what will be the antigen, so the part of the, the pathogen that you need to protect, what will be the technology you will use to deliver that uh, antigen, and that can be, we have heard a lot about mRNA vaccines, live vector vaccine, adjuvanted vaccine, and for all of those, the process exist for already licensed vaccine, like adjuvant, or they are in late development, like live vectors or mRNA. So all that part, which is a bulk of what you need to do a vaccine, which is defining what will be the antigen, what will be the delivery, uh, develop the process, validate the process, do GMP material, define the QC, all that part really already exists exist today and in, in all the different uh, um, pharmaceutical companies. So what you have to do is produce what's called good manufacturing practice lot so that you can administer to human and start your clinical trial. There has been a precedent with accelerated studies in the case of Ebola. So you do a phase one. Phase one is safety, a small number individual. Phase two is to look at the type of immunogenicity you induce in the individual. And then you go to larger trial, which are to demonstrate the efficacy of the vaccine. In the case of um, COVID, it's more complicated because you will demonstrate the efficacy once people are uh, um, in contact of the, the pathogen. So given that uh, SARS is probably going to remain and, and still exist, that, that will happen. So phase, you can combine phase one, two, so that can be very fast. You already have material that you know is uh, of uh, licensure quality, so you can move to phase two rapidly and to phase three, and that's what we see today. Uh, the, today, what is critical is to have the correct design of the phase three to be able to, to come to a conclusion of uh, what is the level of efficacy of the vaccine. And, uh, and recently, actually, the FDA announced that uh, they will uh, they will license a vaccine that is efficacious in 50% of the population, at least. So that's very different from classical vaccine, where you 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 want a vaccine that is efficacious to the at least 80, 90, 100 percent of the people that will get it. So we are in a completely different setting, and because all the means and the way to produce the vaccine have already been developed, that very long part, which is defining, designing, and producing, is already established. So it is feasible to do it in, in that amount of time. What will be long is the efficacy study to, to really see what is the efficacy of, uh, of the different vaccines that are being tested. You mean the, the efficacy study will last after they will continue after the vaccine? No, is I think most, most. So the first, uh, there's the high efficacy study that are starting. Uh, the, the the probably the first one is yeah. Moderna, as they announced in July, but others are going to continue to come. Uh, and actually, if you, you you do it in an area where the the virus is still active, then you will be able to see the efficacy fast. Mm -hmm. So the the this, this is the right time to to really assess. Uh, candidate vaccines. Mm -hmm. Uh, Reno, we know that 200 labs are working on COVID-19 vaccines. At least 11 vaccines are currently undergoing clinical trials. Uh, may I call upon the professor of uh, vaccines research? Um, each of them is based on specific know-how, which means these vaccines will uh, use um, different process, actually. Yeah, yeah. The, you are correct. There are more than 200 vaccines in, in uh, development. 
and uh, the number tells you that uh, it's really uh, somehow easy to make uh, uh, the, uh, the early phase of vaccines. Um, and the reason is that uh, most of the vaccines, with the exception of one in China, which is done the classical way of growing the virus or killing the virus, all the other vaccines are completely made out of the synthetic, synthetic genes. Basically, uh, instead of working with the virus, the people look at the sequence that the Chinese have put in the internet on uh, January 10th, the genomic sequence, and made the synthetic gene mimicking, uh, obviously, the sequence of the virus. And that, using that synthetic gene, they made three types of vaccines. Uh, the first one is basically called what we call RNA vaccines, uh, where basically you use a synthetic gene to transcribe RNA, uh, which is also a synthetic uh, RNA, and that is used as a vaccine. These are the fastest to make, and they were, they were the first ones to enter clinical trials, only 66 days after the sequence has been released. Uh, these are new vaccines, the, uh, very promising, uh, and they are now uh, in phase two, they are planning to start phase three in August. Uh, the good thing is that entire new technology, beautifully com complete synthetic, but we don't have experience with these things. So we don't, they've never been used in large scale, in large scale in the population, never, never been produced in large scale. Huge investments are going on, so we are hope, hopefully we'll see this vaccine succeed. But there are still uncertainties about the future because we never done the complete cycle. The second type of vaccines are the ones where you take the same synthetic genes and you splice into a, vector, a viral vector. And these are chimp adenovirus, measles virus, MVA, several different viruses. And uh, also these vaccines are in clinical trials. Actually one, the Oxford one is already in phase three uh, efficacy trials. And uh, also these vaccines are uh, good. They, they, are, uh, they are immunogenic, they're safe. Uh, one vaccine, the Ebola vaccine with this technology is already licensed, but also with these vaccines, we don't have the full experience of producing in hundreds of millions of uh, doses and uh, we don't have the safety in hundreds of millions of people. So uh, more mature than RNA, but still some uncertainties about this. The third type of vaccines, the more classical vaccines, which are the ones that we, which we have experienced. And those are vaccines where the same synthetic gene has been used to engineer a cell, uh, usually a eukaryotic cell, to make a, a synthetic a protein that we can be purified and used as a vaccine. These vaccines usually require an adjuvant, and there are several uh, of these vaccines are starting clinical trials or about to start clinical trials. These are the ones that take longer to enter clinical trials, but once they start clinical trials, the pace will be the same. So we expect uh, these uh, vaccines to be, uh, these protein-based vaccines con with adjuvants to be produced in large quantities because we have a lot, lot of experience. Uh, industry is ready, the regulatory, People are ready with this because we have many vaccines of so this type already licensed. So these three vaccines are uh, all uh, derived from synthetic genes derived from the sequence. And I'm pretty sure that some of them will be uh, very good. And uh, I think th those are the three types of vaccines that uh, basically summarize more uh, the 200 vaccines which are out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Natalie just talked about uh, talked about the the efficacy rate uh, of the vaccine. What kind of rate would you target? Is it uh, true that since it's a pandemic, um, we can consider that the the rate of efficacy can be lower than usually for other disease? Well, that's the there are two answers. One is the one that Ali was ref uh, referring to, is there is a guideline by the regulatory agencies, the basically FDA that says, uh, we want vaccines at least 50% efficacious, and then if they're 90%, it's much better, obviously. Uh, from my point of view, I think the, I mean, this is a pandemic. Right now, we don't have anything. We have nothing 
only social distancing and masks. So anything better than nothing for me is good. Uh, obviously, the better uh, if we get something which is 90% effective is much better than if you get something which is 50%. Uh, but I think the and we may have we don't know yet. We have to wait for the efficacy trials. We can have vaccines that come early uh, will be the first generation that may be not perfect but good enough, and then we may have vaccines that come later but that w will be. Uh, more experience and optimized to be very good. So I think we we need to wait and see, and and, and I think anything is going to be good provided it's safe and got some efficacy. Okay, thank you, uh, Paul Henri uh, Lambert. You are uh, in uh, Geneva, and um, now uh, we know that to have a vaccine that to, that induces immunity is one thing, but um, we also want to know uh, better about the safety. We just talked about it uh, with uh, Reno. Uh, this is a major concern in the population efficacy and safety, especially with the unprecedented speed at uh, which vaccines are developed. So, Paul-Henri Lambert, you have been uh, the chief of vaccine research and development at WHO, and you recently produced an important report on how to address risk issues. Uh, this report was commissioned by CEPI, the most important international organization supervising most vaccines in development. In this report, you focused on the risk of disease enhancement by vaccines. This is quite frightening. Could you tell us more about this risk and also tell us how it will be prevented? Paul-Henri Lambert, can you hear us? Paul-Henri. Yes. See. Okay. <laughs> Did you hear my question? I, yes. That, that. Okay, fine. Uh, yes, when you develop a vaccine, you hope that your vaccine will protect the people who are vaccinated. And certainly one thing that you don't want is a vaccine that would enhance the disease to which you are exposed. And the risk of disease enhancement is a theoretical risk for COVID-19. It has never been seen in human uh, people, but it has been seen in animals that were immunized against the previous coronavirus uh, disease, against SARS and again MERS. So in some, with some vaccine, it was shown that these vaccines were not perfectly protecting the animal against the infection. And they were enhancing the disease when the same animal were exposed to the virus. So the problem is an important one because you would not like to have a vaccine that would enhance the disease in most of the people who, who have in fact a mild disease. Now the developers uh, who are now developing vaccine are aware of the risk and they use appropriate formulation to reduce the risk to a minimum. So that at this point... To the minimum. To a minimum, that means that uh, the risk becomes really very rare, you know. So far, uh, let's say the news are relatively good in the sense that so far none of the candidate vaccines which have been tested in non-human primates have shown such a risk. So uh, we can be confident that the risk will be reduced. In fact, vaccine that would not be fully safe in the preclinical testing would certainly not be used in humans. Obviously, when we move to large clinical trial, there will be a need to particular, for a particular attention given to rapid detection, real-time monitoring of this type of adverse event. And uh, this is being uh, certainly looked at very seriously. It will be critical for the development of this vaccine. 
Uh, we are also we hear also a lot about other uh, negative, um, protective side effects of vaccine. Uh, but also by shrinking the, the time frames to this point, there are things about which we have less information than usual, such as the duration of immunity conferred by the vaccine. Yes. Well, in fact, if you accelerate the development of vaccines, you know, safety will remain the main driver for vaccine development. Uh, companies do not like to see adverse events. And it's clear that we, as the population that will be vaccinated, do not like this kind of adverse event. So it's a key issue. And therefore, even if you accelerate the process of development, the safety part of the development remain exactly the same. If you develop a vaccine in 10 years, or if you develop it in one year, you have to do the same kind of test. And this can be done in this particular case in the sense that what is being used to produce vaccine or to develop vaccine are what is called vaccine platforms. That means this platform exists already. And we know already that this platform, this technical approach to develop a vaccine are safe. We know what we have to look at. And this is the reason why safety can be looked at in a very short time. I think that one important step would, would come after licensing of the vaccine, in fact, where post-licensing surveillance will be done as usual to monitor uh, adverse effect, but particularly to monitor rare and unexpected adverse ev events. So this will be done, will take more time, and will be really looking at, at the very rare things which may occur, and we know that we cannot detect everything beforehand. Mm -hmm. Regarding the, the duration of immunity, well, we have to, at that point, we have to say that we don't know how long the immunity will, will last. You know, we will see with the different vaccines that are being developed. Uh, I think that this will certainly vary with the different vaccines which are being used. One can expect that at least six months to one year of protection will be reached. And if, if this is the case, then the boosting with another dose of vaccine will have to be done after six months or after one year. But uh, I think that this has been seen before for flu vaccine, and we can cope with this kind of short, relatively short duration of protection. Vaccines we are, which are in the pipeline at the moment, um, do they use one dose or two doses? Do you get one or two shots? To get the immunity. Some, some are using one dose, hoping that one dose will work. But most of the vaccine use two doses. How long do you need to wait before you can get the second dose? We still well, don't know. Usually people, you know, try to do it after one month. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can try even an accelerated uh, schedule, giving the second dose after only two weeks. Okay, um, I um, ask a question to Mathias de Watripon uh, because you have to leave uh, earlier, Mathias. Uh, so uh, I would like uh, to talk uh, with you about uh, the fact that uh, several companies are expected to be among the first to launch the vaccines. Uh, I won't tell names, but uh, telling um, you are going to be uh, in good place in this race or you are going to be the first uh, in this race seems to be very important. Uh, does this provide uh, the, the, the companies with a financial advantage? Well, I think that what we are saying right now, seeing right now is obviously a huge interest and it's, uh, it's good. Uh, for society as a whole in uh, developing vaccine research. Uh, typically, uh, we can argue that uh, capitalism is has its disadvantages, but it's good that innovation 
uh, and you know, bottom up innovation, uh, let a thousand flowers bloom, or in this case, 200, uh, is I think uh, potentially a promising uh, avenue. Uh, the uh, many states are happy to put in a lot of money, investors too. I think some of it will be wasted, but that's fine. Uh, I guess uh, these are things that, that happen. Uh, we could ask a question about uh, how much decentralization is needed. People often make a difference between uh, peacetime and wartime. And in wartime, the state takes over and coordination becomes very important. And that has the advantage of uh, going fast. Now, some people are talking about the fact that we are at war with the virus. And so it could be a question to ask, you know, is 200 or maybe too much? Uh, but on the other hand, if money is there and there are enough politicians who are ready to throw a lot of taxpayer money in order to get reelected, uh, e.g. In the, in the U.S., uh, maybe, you know, given the cost of this disease, uh, it's okay. Still, uh, we have to be worried, I think, not necessarily about the economic cost, the financial cost, but about the political cost. Because what you see is that a number of these companies, especially smaller companies who are betting uh, on uh, big money and otherwise they will just go bankrupt, uh, there is a tendency at times for some of them to exaggerate uh, what they, uh, how promising their formula is. And they were, for example, not to name names, uh, Moderna uh, has been uh, a biotech company in Massachusetts, has been uh, criticized for over-promising in order to attract a lot of money in the stock market and even for some of uh, their management to cashing on, uh, on, uh, and selling their shares. And, you know, these kinds of things, we live in a world where uh, politics is complicated, where anti-vax are, uh, are uh, excessively noisy and the like. Uh, so we have to be worried about not making this too much of uh, wild capitalism. So in that sense, I think the fact that big companies are uh, kind of uh, collaborating and they have a lot more reputation, their whole reputation at stake. So I think we can trust them more than small companies that could be uh, taking the money and run. On the other hand, maybe they have the solution. So we also want to give them a chance. But let's say, I think overall, uh, capitalism is probably working here, but we have to be careful to, uh, uh, to regulate it properly, I think. You know what we say in crisis communication, Matthias, that every crisis can be um, uh, a challenge and, and can be also an opportunity for you to go further. And so maybe that's what they are doing this time. We'll see in a few months <laughs> what they did. Um, another question is about the fact that some countries have chosen proactive approach, uh, investing money in vaccine research. Uh, you talked and we talked about the US, uh, the UK, Brazil, Germany, many others, actually. Uh, it can be seen as a risk, but isn't it instead an investment for them? Well, I think, as I say, in general, the fact that uh, public money is going towards uh, uh, research, you know, I'm a bit biased being a researcher, if only... Yeah, but regarding to the cost of a lockdown, Matthias, I'm sorry if I wasn't... No, no, I mean, I think it's investing public money into these things is a good idea in general. Uh, of course, uh, what you want is... Uh, all this money to help contribute to a global solution. If it's money spent to divert potential uh, vaccines to your own country, and some countries have been doing it, uh, I think in particular the US has the advantage of having a strategy through BARDA, through uh, the NIH and so on. But when you hear that they are trying, sometimes they are criticizing, criticized for trying to uh, kind of uh, obtain uh, the output of all this for themselves as opposed to others, that I don't think is great for the common good. Uh, now, my hope is that there will be sufficient pressure from the international level to make sure that the outcome, uh, if successful, is shared reasonably, uh, reasonably broadly. 
Mm-hmm. But uh, as I say, I'm all for, uh, I think we should all be for uh, more uh, state money going into uh, vaccine research. Uh, if it's about uh, diverting the, the results to uh, your own, I think that's a problem. Okay. Thank you so much, Mathias, uh, for uh, joining us and for being with us. Um, Hélène Atoun, um, I'm coming to you. You are uh, in the Netherlands and you are the director of Medicines Law and Policy and the founder of uh, the Medicines Patent Pool. Uh, that's the second time you join us, actually, Hélène. Thank you for being there. Uh, talking about new drugs also means talking about pricing and talking about access, uh, as we just said. Uh, before we get to the heart of the matter, I'd like you to help the public and, and all of us also to better understand who are these organizations whose names suddenly became uh, recurrent in the media. We hear about Gavi, Sepi, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They are negotiating in some somehow they are negotiating with the companies for a better access in, uh, to the vaccine in poor countries, is it? Thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you for inviting me, me back. It's a, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, and um, I always learn a lot from these meetings and I enjoy it a great deal. Um, the, the roles of these, um, these organizations, SEPI and GAVI, are, are quite different. Um, SEPI, which stands for the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, um, its main role is to fund the research and development and of, of new vaccines to be able to, to respond to, uh, uh, to, to outbreaks of infectious diseases. And it has its origins in 2014 uh, Ebola outbreak in West Africa when the world sort of woke up to the fact that the, it was absolutely not prepared to deal with this. Um, an extra element, of course, was that a, a vaccine was actually um, was actually there, but it was sitting on a shelf and, and its development had not been completed. Had that happened, it probably would have saved uh, many lives. So that is the role of SEPI. Now, Gavi is responsible for negotiating vaccine prices and making those vaccines available in low-income countries. Um, in, uh, initially, Gavi's um, area of work are, are the poorest countries of, of the world. Now, in this COVID-19 new reality, the roles and responsibilities of these agencies has, has hugely expanded. Now, you, you mentioned the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation actually played a, a pivotal role in the establishment of these agencies and still plays an important role also, uh, or particularly now plays an important role in bringing these agencies uh, together. There's a, um, the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, known as ACT A, uh, Sepi and Gavi are jointly responsible for the vaccine pillar in this initiative. There are other pillars to deal with therapeutics and <clears throat> diagnostics and, and equitable distribution. And of course, the World Health Organization plays, a, plays an important role in that. This vaccine pillar, which is known as Co the COVAX, uh, contains a COVAX uh, facility which organizes the global procurement for potential COVID-19 vaccines um, and, and SAPI will, will continue to lead the research and development um, uh, work stream. The World Health Organization will lead on, on policy and allocation. The key question once vaccine or vaccines are there, who will be served first? Um, so that is another important part of that, that work. Um, Another initiative which you have not mentioned is the World Health Organization um, COVID-19 Technology Access Pool or CTAP. There's a whole, whole list of new abbreviations we have, to, we have to get used to. And CTAP aims at making sure that, as, as many have, have called it, no one owns the vaccine and that knowledge, know-how, intellectual property is shared with others to enable large-scale uh, production. CTAP is, is focused on all tools that are necessary to respond to the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. So, uh, so far, uh, these, the, the coherence between this is still lacking. For example, SEPI is not collaborating uh, with CTAP yet. 
And it would be important that that changes because any agency that is spending money, we've heard in this in this this conversation, billions are are, are being spent. Governments are 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 very keen on spending vast amounts of money to make sure that these health tools become available. But in order to ensure that there will be access and that there will be equitable access, you need to also now start organizing for that. And that will require attaching some conditions to this financing to make sure that the knowledge that is generated with this public money also remains publicly uh, available and will be and, re and becomes available for others. Uh, for others to use, there's quite still quite a bit of work to be done uh, to be done there, um, but that is that is sort of the, the landscape of emerging new initiatives or older initiatives whose mandate have uh, have expanded. Of course, the medicines patent pool, which you mentioned, is one of those uh, agencies that have fairly quickly expanded its mandate to be able to work on on COVID nineteen. Now, I'm not sure whether I've made things any clearer for the yes, for those did, that are did. watching but uh, <laughs> this is sort of the the abbreviated version uh, of it don't worry we will invite you for a third time don't worry you did well <laughs> um reno maybe you can help us with that uh reno or Polly. um since you work for a pharmaceutical company, uh, you probably know that when you uh, have an agreement or a pre-agreement with the government, what does that mean? You, you had an agreement also with uh, uh, all these organizations to deal the fact that if you provide, I don't know how many millions of doses to a government in a rich country, you will have to provide as many or I don't know how many millions of doses to a low-income country. Well, the, I mean, in, in a company today, the things we have in mind that we would like to make the vaccine available to all countries at the, at the same time, if possible. That's the reason why we made our adjuvants available to many different companies in Asia, uh, Australia, uh, uh, Europe and North America. So that basically the vaccines would be available, manufactured in different places and, and, and available. Uh, then obviously there are some countries in, uh, who, in the other things that we did, what, our first deal was with CEPI. CEPI is obviously uh, making, is making the, uh, uh, the scope is to make vaccine available for low income countries as well to, to have equal, equitable distribution. So uh, we have made agreements and uh, with all the uh, partners to make sure that the vaccines will be available to uh, to rich and poor people, if you like, at the same time. Obviously, there are some countries that are paying more money than others. Uh, that can be seen as a, they will have probably the first doses. And I uh, cannot talk for all companies, but they may, that may happen. Uh, but there is um, also uh, a second part is that more money will accelerate vaccine development. So that's also useful because if you get vaccine faster, it will be faster for everybody. So I think overall, uh, yes, there is uh, a country and the, the, there is the tendency for some countries, especially the richest ones, to try to pay more so they can get the first doses. But there's also enough uh, uh, bodies and CEPI, Gavi, uh, COVID, all, all these organizations and WHO that are making uh, taking care of making sure that vaccines will be available uh, globally. Is there no risk that, for example, a country has a vaccine? Let's say, for example, the US will have it probably among the first to get the vaccine since they have invested so much in many companies. Uh, probably they will be among the first. Um, and then what? Uh, if a country hasn't ordered yet or if it hasn't uh, provided so much money to a company, how long will they have to wait? Um, talking also about countries like ours, for example, we, we didn't, instead it, it has changed, but we, we didn't, uh, uh, we do, still don't know if we will have doses and which doses, of course we will have, but which and when, we, we still don't know. So how long well, does it take from a country to another? Difficult to answer this question because we don't know which vaccines will succeed and what time. The, I, would, I would say that the effort, the global effort and the global investment is basically to prepare 
to manufacture not under a million doses, which will be for a country or or for thing, but we are talking about manufacturing billions of billions of doses of vaccines. And if we manufacture we manage to manufacture billions of doses, then will not be a country which will be left behind because will be enough for everybody. So I, I, th I think maybe a few months of the uh, difference between one and the other, but uh, I think that's the global effort which is being done. And you know, there have been uh, some companies that already said that manufacturing uh, a billion for the uh, rich countries, two billions for the low income countries. So uh, hopefully these vaccines will work and that problem will not exist. Uh, but there is always the risk that some countries will get the first doses before Thank you. Uh, Michel Goldman, I'd like to come uh, back to you because we haven't talked about uh, the European Commission yet. And uh, actually, the European Commission is expected to set up a fund worth 2.4 billion devoted to enacting purchase agreements to buy COVID-19 vaccines. Um, how can you explain, Michel, that nothing has uh, been made uh, was made uh, to invest money in developing a vaccine like it was made in the US. Well, actually, that's not really true. I mean, the European Commission, since years all over the different framework program, has invested in uh, research and development of vaccine. And for example, Paul Arvin Aubert and Rino have been very active in, in European programs. The point is that when it comes to translation in the practice at speed, at scale. This is what we need now. Probably that the current instruments of the European Union, European Commission are not, I would say, completely appropriate. So the research is good, but you don't reach, I would say, the ultimate goal, which is to have products on the market reaching the patients uh, rapidly enough, and certainly that the amount invested is, is also not enough. And all goes together, because to get the product on the vaccines, you need to organize costly uh, clinical trials. And um, I think that the European Commission uh, decided to indeed uh, invest and promote CEPI, which might be indeed a new way also for the European Commission to, to promote the development of vaccines for pandemics. And I think this is really appropriate. Just to give you an example, during the SARS epidemics in 2003, the European Commission launched a series of programs to develop vaccines, uh, even elsewhere. And as you know, some vaccines were in development and then everything was stopped. And actually we would have those vaccines uh, they might be useful even today with the uh, current uh, pandemics. So it's a question of uh, resources that you invest and how you, how you invest them with really a goal of rapid application. And the point is that this is exactly what the US is doing. And my current concern is to see all the major companies, including the pharma companies based in Europe, going to the US, especially the so-called BARDA agency, which is an agency from the US government, to get the funds they need for developing their product. Obviously, there are also some efforts in Europe, in a way they are obliged to. But what, when I compare, for example, what is invested in the Innovative Medicines Initiative that I know best, and what is done in the US, there is nothing to compare. So it's both a question of the amount of money, but also how this money is, uh, is organized and spent. It's a delicate equilibrium because you, have, you must help the companies to be as efficient and fast as possible. And at the same time, you have to make sure with the companies that when the product will be there, it will be under conditions that are affordable for everyone. And that's something which is not always easy to achieve. And that's why we and others, I think that Ellen is doing a huge effort in this direction, is to ask for negotiation at the very early phase. When the products are there, you are in a weak position to negotiate with the company. It's at the very beginning when you start to support them that you have to agree on what will be the conditions at the end 
under which the products will be accessible. Ilan, maybe can you explain to us what uh, Michel just uh, said? Uh, can you explain to us how it works? Well, <clears throat> I think the, the, the key issue is uh, that, that Michel raises is actually the issue that, that, that the CTAP is, is, is trying to, uh, to, to, to respond to. Um, you hear quite often now people say, oh, well, don't don't fuss too much over, over, over access and, and, and agreements uh, about that. Let those companies do, do, their, do their work. We'll deal with that once the products are there. And as Michelle points out, that is very, very difficult. It is much easier and it makes, mu and much, more, it makes much more sense to get those norms set, to get those agreements set as early as um, as possible. If you if you just look at what is um, what is happening uh, today, if you look at at, uh, at Remdesivir, uh, Gilead's antiviral, which has a conditional marketing authorization in the European Union, um, based on a study carried out by the uh, by the U.S. Uh, National Institutes of Health, we learned last 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 week their their pricing policies, which is which is quite high um, and we learned that the US had bought up the entire uh, supply of the of the drug. Now we also see at the same time countries as some of you have pointed out placing pre-orders for potential vaccines, they're placing bets base, basically in an attempt to to jump the um, to jump the queue which may lead to a situation where you cannot sensibly prioritize. It would really be um, uh, very, very regretful if, for example, uh, people at low risk in rich countries would receive the vaccine before healthcare workers in South Africa do. That should not be allowed. But we can all agree on that. When you talk to people about it, everyone says, oh, yes, of course, that should absolutely not happen. But it will happen unless you make agreements. And those agreements will have to be made at the um, at the international at the international level, of course, the World Health Organization will have to play a, a leading role in that. But you also need to put the measures in place that will lead to that sharing, and that is where the question of the funding and the conditions, the funding for the research and development, uh, extremely important, but also attaching conditions to how the results of that research and development is shared once it um, it becomes uh, once it becomes available things that WHO showed today are of course difficult with the united states moving ahead with its uh, with its withdrawal but i'm um, i'm optimistically thinking that we could perhaps still uh, uh, develop some 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 good agreements based on a consensus minus one Nathalie Garçon, uh, developing a vaccine in such a short time is a challenge, but that's not the biggest uh, the industry will have to face. Uh, to make the vaccine available everywhere, as we are talking, uh, it, it will take uh, billions of doses. So how can pharmaceutical companies manufacture so many products? Uh, do they have enough raw materials at the moment? Um, and also, are some of all the vaccines uh, that are under production, I mean, under uh, trial, um, some of them maybe are easier to produce than others at scale, I mean. Nathalie? Sorry, I keep putting mute. Uh, producing at scale is all relative uh, now. If we're talking about billions of doses in such a short time, that certainly has never been done. And actually, that that's that the chance and the opportunity with the number of vaccines that are being developed. There will not be one vaccine that will be used, as that's clear. There will be many different ones. Now, the question is who and what can be done the fastest and, uh, and at the highest uh, dose. Clearly, when you use um, technology platform that exists for vaccine that are already licensed, it is much easier to, to produce a vaccine that way. The, one of the one Reno was talking about, which is uh, genetic engineering, where you produce uh, antigens in, in the expression system, 
this exists more than 40 years. So this is known, this is uh, developed, it's, it's not an issue to do it. Then once you have the antigen, uh, there's another aspect which you talked about, which is adjuvants. Uh, again, probably there won't be one, there will be many. And that brings a, a, a possibility for those vaccines. And that's why actually companies have, uh, have pulled together. And that has been developed during the flu pandemic. It's called mix and match. You can take an antigen from a company and an adjuvant from another, and you, you put them together. That gives you one more possibility to do a vaccine when those people may not have a, an adjuvant or a delivery system that will be able to use for your antigen. So you need to have enough antigen produced. You need mRNA is the same. I mean, it's a, it, it's faster, but it's a completely new technology. So that, that has a, it has to be secure. And... So that that's the way to do it. The the other thing that was uh, certainly implemented during the pandemic flu is what's called dose sparing. And uh, if you can, by the use of an adjuvant or anything that can give you a higher immune response for the same amount of antigen, or with less antigen, give you an an immune response which is protective, that can allow you for one given amount of antigen to have four or five doses rather than one. So there are ways to to optimize the material you will have. And actually, uh, Michel was talking about BARDA, and that's something certainly they do, and they have implemented in many different ways. So what you need, and that's, that's what's nice in a way through that crisis, is that um, people have pulled together what they have, what they know that can work, to make sure that by mixing and matching, we will be able to have enough vaccine for everybody. I don't think that, uh, I'm pretty sure actually, that it has never ever, we have had to produce so many doses in a, such a short time. Even the pandemic was hundreds of millions of doses, Ebola was uh, not even million. So it's it's a completely different, uh, different situation, but that can be, uh, that can be solved by putting everything together, being creative in the way you, you put one antigen with one formulation, uh, accelerating the development of the process for mRNA. Live vector, live vector have been, the first time they were test, tested in human is at least 50 years ago. So it is known, it's just, uh, and it was said before, it was not moved forward all the way to a final product, but uh, a lot of steps have, have been done. And uh, if you if you put the wheel in, uh, in delivering that, that that's possible but one thing for sure there won't be just one vaccine it's just impossible yeah, but of course we will have several vaccines and that's that's better because we will need uh, so many doses but how long would you say if we have to bet how, how long would you bet that it would take to get this vaccine available like not for everyone in every country because as i I said, and as I think, because we see that in the in the polls that have been made, not everyone will get a vaccine. Uh, so at least for half of the population in each country that would desire probably to get the vaccine, how long will it take? It will, it would take something like a year at least. No, no. no? The, I mean, companies have already started. Uh, I mean, there has been uh, AstraZeneca is already uh, gearing to produce uh, the live vector vaccine from uh, Jenner Institute, uh, GSK has provided and will provide the adjuvant to the people that have the antigen. Those, uh, again, those process exist. Uh, oops, sorry. Those process nice exist. Song. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? Uh, so th those process exist is question of producing. The question here is is more, you will need to produce at risk somehow because you, you cannot wait to have the, the results of the efficacy try to start producing. So th that that's more of the debate, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Reno, maybe you can help us with that, because when you say producing at risk, when we say that, of course, there's a risk. Uh, but there is also an help, because uh, all the money that has been invested by some government uh, was also used for that, uh, to prepare the production, the manufacturing, and, and, and so on. Yeah, I think one uh, useful thing that is happening with this pandemic is that this unprecedented amount of money that is being made available. And the money uh, that is made available is being used exactly for uh, 
to in basically allow the companies to take risks that otherwise they will not be able to take uh, because they will go bankrupt. Because as Natalie was saying, I mean, if a company decides to make a billion doses and then the vaccine doesn't work or the vaccine works but the pandemic is gone and nobody wants the vaccine anymore, like happened in 2009 with the influenza uh, uh, pandemic, then the company will go bankrupt. So the upfront money that is being put to cover the cost at risk by governments uh, and by SEPI and by other institutions is the money that is necessary to take the financial risk that the company will not be able to afford. So there is a, I mean, companies are putting up their, basically, uh, they're risking because they're not, uh, they're doing a project and making a vaccine that was not in their pipeline and they're probably slowing down the development of other vaccines. But uh, the uh, financial risk is being taken mostly by the public sector, I would say. Mm -hmm. um... Uh, Michel Kazachkin, I haven't heard you a lot today, <laughs> so I would like uh, to talk uh, to you about uh, the fact that uh, you have been one of the signatories of uh, a call that has been made uh, by more than 140 world leaders and experts and elders also uh, for making all COVID-19 treatments and vaccines free of charge for everyone. Um, so as I said, you, you, you signed it and when you state um, that, it means that you want the vaccine to be considered as a common good. Uh, what do you mean? Do you intend that pharmaceutical companies have to provide the vaccine for free? No, uh, Vanessa, certainly not. But the issue of price and the issue of these early agreements and negotiations that Ellen and others were raising are essential. But uh, it is a call on governments and on what we call the international community to ensure that when a safe or several safe and effective vaccines is are developed, they are made available for all people free of charge. And the reason for that is that because even a small fee can be uh, an obstacle and we do not need additional obstacles to access and uptake. And we have experience in that area with the HIV medicines. As soon as the HIV medicines became free, even if they were not expensive for some of them, that has been a game changer for, for uptake and access. So uh, someone at the end will have to pay, as you said. Uh, and obviously it will be a responsibility of the state, of the government. I'm not too worried about the rich countries. They will buy it, whatever the cost, as President Macron said recently. Uh, and, and those citizens will, will, will have it. I'm also not too worried somehow about uh, the poorest countries, the low-income countries, because we have these mechanisms Ellen told earlier to us about Gavi and the agreements that are being discussed and negotiated. And there are global funds, there are global mechanisms that will, I think, ensure that for countries that cannot pay for it, uh, vaccines will be available. I'm more concerned about what's called middle income countries. That is countries that are not rich enough to buy it w whatever the cost and countries that are not poor enough somehow to uh, be subsidized by the international community. Uh, and that is Latin America, that is Eastern Europe and Central Asia, that is large parts of Asia and quite a number of, of countries in Africa. And, and those countries called middle income countries, according to the World Bank, are the countries where the largest number of poor people in the world live in absolute numbers. Poor people are people with less than $2 per day. Uh, and and the, the, the largest number of these people, over 1.5 billion poor people live in these middle income countries. And that's why at the end, the issue of price will be so important. It'll be important 
for, for everyone, but it will be very important for international organizations, for international aid, whether multilateral or bilateral, to fund or co-fund with countries uh, access to people in, in low and in middle income countries. So that at the end, as the end point of it, access and uptake is, is, is free. Thank you, Michel. Uh, Hélène uh, Atsun, I know you also support the idea of a, a free vaccine. Uh, some countries actually are voting laws allowing them to activate a mechanism called compulsory licensing. Uh, could you explain us what it is and to tell us if it will be necessary in this case? Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, to, to, to be clear, when uh, we talk about the, the vaccine should should be free. Um, uh, that uh, that doesn't that doesn't mean that, um, uh, that someone should not be paying for the cost. The, of course, the cost of course <laughs> needs, needs needs to be yeah yeah free for the patient. I, I would like to say uh, well, there's another element of free, and that is I think that the vaccine should be free from um, from monopoly. And uh, as I said, someone will have to pay for it, but that doesn't. Um, necessarily mean paying a, a high price. Um, exorbitant profits are also not necessary because so much of public financing is going into the development of these vaccines um, already. So this, this model of having to recoup the research and development through high pricing, uh, it doesn't really uh, apply here. So this gives a lot of space for having an entirely different way of making sure that these vaccines can go um, to countries at cost. And then, of course, you have to figure out who will who will pay the cost. And I absolutely agree with Michel Kazachkin. Uh, the, the, the concern will really be the, the middle income countries. We've seen that with other vaccines where they fall out of the boat of, 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 of initiatives such as Gavi because they're focused on the poorest countries. Um, and these middle income countries simply don't have the resources to purchase at the price these vaccines uh, are, 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 offered, are offered to them. So that model should really, we should really avoid that model um, here. Now, when we talk about compulsory licensing, uh, that is a, a, a mechanism, it's a measure that is contained in most, uh, in most patent laws of countries, uh, countries around the world that allows a, a government to um, to give someone else who is not the patent holder the right to use the patent without the consent of the patent holder against the payment of a reasonable royalty. It's an important measure when a patent forms a barrier to accessing on favorable terms a, a certain a certain technology or a certain uh, a certain medicine. So if we go back to remdesivir. I, I, I wish it was a more effective medicine, but it, 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 tells a, it tells a good story if Belgium would like to purchase it, but cannot because the supply has been committed to the United States. There are generic companies making this product. Those are a number of them are, are licensees from Gilead. There's also a company in Bangladesh where patents don't play a role because Bangladesh is a least developed country, doesn't have to enforce patent and, and Gilead has not applied for patents there. So Belgium could then, um, setting the patent aside that Gilead has on its, on its territory, place an order with a generic company. So in a way, compulsory license lifts the monopoly effect of a patent. The patent stays in place. Uh, you, you would have to pay, you would have to remunerate the, the patent holder, uh, but the patent holder cannot stop others from supplying. That's what it does. Now, it's, it can be helpful. You have to make sure as government that you have it in your toolbox, but it is a product by product and country by country measure. So it would be, uh, much more desirable if we had a collective approach, such as we created with the medicines patent pool for HIV medicines, where licenses are available for all WHO recommended treatments in one uh, in one place, and that is exactly what is foreseen by um, by, by 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 the WHO uh, CTAP. Another important element is that compulsory licensing. Uh, alone does not foresee 
um, in the transfer of other bits of intellectual property, particularly important for vaccines and other, and, and other biologics where you need to know how and the technology itself that needs to be transferred. So trying to have agreements about that upfront is, uh, is, is probably uh, more desirable. But again, if these voluntary agreements do not emerge, if that is, does not succeed, then compulsory measures may have to, be, have to be taken. And a number of countries therefore have been sharpening their compulsory licensing legislation, including a number of high income countries, Germany, for example, Canada, um, Hungary recently, Hungary has, 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 has informed the WTO of its plans, Israel already issued a compulsory license. So we're inevitably going to see countries explore what compulsory measures they can take if the voluntary agreements do not emerge or do not deliver. Mm -hmm. Rina Rapoli, is this going to be necessary? Because I heard a lot of companies uh, stating and um, telling that um, they they have that, that that they they are committed to provide the vaccine to everyone and to uh, make it global. Um, and um, how how do you uh, feel that some also other companies said they they will produce and they will. Uh, only charged at non-profit during the time of the pandemic. So is this maybe a problem that we won't have to face during the pandemic? Well, I believe seeing the, having seen the collaborative spirit between companies, biotech, governments, regulatory agencies uh, in, in, in dealing with the COVID-19, uh, frankly, I don't believe intellectual property will be an obstacle. I don't think it will be necessary to have compulsory licensing for vaccines uh, because the spirit is very collaborative and the, and the companies are uh, uh, really trying to solve the problem rather than defend the rights at this point, which doesn't mean in the future if this becomes a commercial product post-pandemic, uh, that then the, uh, the rules of the uh, uh, commercial uh, commercial rules will come back, uh, but at this point, I don't think the intellectual property will be a problem to make the vaccine available globally. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Natalie. I would um, come back on one point. Actually, we talked about drugs that are pre-ordered, but yet they haven't been approved by the authorities. Uh, we know that also government then have to discuss about the price, the reimbursement and everything. Here we are talking about drugs who are still uh, under clinical trials and um, it is different from what we know. So can you explain the process? How is it that someone can buy something that yet doesn't exist? She's unmuting. Yeah, I still don't have the reflex. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I think it, the explanation is in what everything that has been said before. We are in a unusual circumstances, and somehow the so the process is the same in terms of production, uh, regulatory agency approval, quality control. This is exactly the same. The difference is that uh, there are pre-ordering that are being made somehow also to have an idea of how much has to be produced, how much has to be delivered. And uh, this is not very different from what exists already when you supply uh, Gavi or organization that provide vaccines to developing world where every year there are uh, there are requests that are made for a certain number of vaccine that will be delivered by different manufacturers. This is the exact same uh, process. The only difference is that you are ordering something that today is not yet available. I think here you are in you are thinking in terms of success, not in terms of failure. And once the vaccine will be once demonstrated to be safe and efficacious to a level that is acceptable, they will be licensed and they will have to be available now, not in uh, one month after, two months after. That's why they are pre-ordering so that once they are um, they have they have passed their QC, they are licensed. They have to go day one out of the manufacturing. You cannot wait to do that after. There is no way. There, there's a certain sense of urgency right now. Mm -hmm. 
Um, thank you, Nathalie. Uh, Pour Henri Lambert, it seems inconceivable that some pre-order vaccines, some others for which states have invested billions of euros, um, that these vaccines might not be produced, but yet there is still a possibility. Well, that's the point, you know, we cannot exclude that. Uh, it's clear that we think about 200 vaccines, we think about all vaccines being good, but uh, it, this virus is quite clever. And uh, we know that uh, other coronaviruses have represented a challenge for vaccine development. So at this point, we can hope that vaccine will be efficient, but we still have no really full demonstration that they will be. And we know that some, from a vaccine, we expect different things. We expect the protection of individuals. And this is likely to be achieved by a number of vaccines. What we would like as well is to have a protection of the population by uh, reducing the transmission of the, of the virus. And what uh, we know already is that it is practically sure that not all vaccine will do the job. Many vaccines can protect the individual, but will not protect against the transmission of the virus from one individual to another. So if you get to the point where you have to choose the vaccine to be produced, it is clear that not all vaccine will be produced, that some vaccines are not good enough, and you have the real risk that for some countries, you know, selecting a particular vaccine uh, beforehand, even putting large amount of money in the selection, that this vaccine at the end might be not produced and you have to switch to another one. Mm -hmm. This is a, a risk which exists. Mm -hmm. I hope that it's not too high but we have to face it. But that can reassure people and that can let them know that they won't get a bad vaccine, that, that everything will be made for safety and for uh, efficacy also, but for safety. I think that a lot of people probably are concerned about that. Yes, this is another issue is a point that a number of people today would not accept to be vaccinated. We know that in the US, it seems that about half of the people would not accept to be vaccinated. And if you have, in addition to their own feelings, you have some issues of safety, safety which are pending, this will even reduce the risk, reduce the, uh, the percentage of people like being vaccinated. So a real effort that has to be made is try to understand why people are so reluctant of being vaccinated and try to develop the proper communication so that people understand the full, full picture. And I think that a lot of transparency will have to be integrated into communication strategies to make sure that this will improve in the future. Just a last question for you, who should, uh be vaccinated first. Of course, um, all the healthcare, uh, um, I mean, doctor, um, nurses, all, all these people should be vaccinated first because they are very at risk. But after them, who should go first? I mean, health people, old people, um, heal sick people, um, who, who should go well, first? Well, I think there is a, a quite an agreement, a general agreement on the fact that the first people to be vaccinated would be the people at risk, at high risk. That means health uh, workers, uh, people of a certain age, or people who are particularly at risk for other reasons. However, the people to be vaccinated first may depend also on the type of vaccine you have. If you have a vaccine that can block transmission, then it may be really worthwhile to give the vaccine to everyone or to most 
of the people who are really active in the transmission. That means many young people, for example, may be the right target. Uh, we have, this is not unusual, you know, this has been seen for influenza before, where it was seen that vaccinating young children was the best way to protect old individuals. It's the same with pneumococcal vaccine. So this is uh, something that will be determined by the efficacy of the vaccine. If a vaccine is really preventing transmission as well as individual infection, then the strategy will have to be changed. Mm -hmm. uh, Reno, are you working on a pediatric vaccine? Because we know that nowadays our children are said to be at lower risk and uh, not, um, I mean, it's quite rare that they are very sick uh, after uh, being infected. So are you working on that or is it secondary in, at the moment? The, I would say that we are not working yet on the pediatric vaccine and I'm not aware of other companies working on pediatric vaccine. This is not unusual. Because even with normal vaccines, even when we, it takes 10, 20 years to develop the vaccine, the first trials of vaccines are done in adult volunteers. And then you go into uh, other uh, groups, like elderly or pediatric vaccination. So uh, in, in this case, uh, for the moment, uh, there are no vaccines yet in, in children. And the reason is, is twofold. One, because that would be the normal process, but also what you said, that the children are not uh, the ones at highest risk in this moment. Uh, I think uh, pediatric vaccines will be developed if the pandemic continues, uh, but would be uh, in a second moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, Michel Kazashkin, um, a question about um, the fact that vaccination could be mandatory. I saw that in the US a paper was published and some American scientists already established a framework for mandatory vac vaccination. You think it will be necessary? Well, I, I think it's a premature question at this time and Paul-Henri has uh, really given us the answer. It will depend on the type of vaccine and the type of efficacy the vaccine has. Um, obviously, if it's a vaccine that primarily protects the individual from infection, uh, you will first target the most vulnerable people. So uh, I think it's too early to open that discussion. Michel, I would like to have your point of view on something or your feeling maybe. Um, we hear a lot uh, this catch word, the word after. And um, is it just a stylistic effect? I mean, you have been fighting against uh, AIDS for decades now. Uh, still, we don't have a vaccine and we, we see all the damages in the world because of uh, AIDS. Uh, do you think that this pandemic, that COVID-19 will really change something in the preparedness that we will have, that our countries will have and try to acquire against pandemics? Well, thank you. I, yeah, I think in terms of preparedness, uh, COVID will change something. Uh, this is not like AIDS, a crisis where the problem is in the South and the solution was in the North, to make it simple. It's a, it's a 360 degrees, it's a global crisis. And, um, and uh, COVID really illustrated uh, to everyone how inadequate the preparedness uh, has been to a pandemic uh, everywhere. But um, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, after SARS, you know, people came together and said, not, not again, we now will prepare. And all of the countries of the world signed a treaty, a treaty, an international treaty at the World Health Organization, where all countries committed to uncover, to report to WHO, to prepare for and to respond to any outbreak that potentially could become a global health threat. And as you can see, uh, that is not what has been happening in the last months as, as, as with COVID-19. So that international treaty called the International Health Regulations will have to be revisited 
will have to be strengthened. And I'm pretty sure that that will happen. Now, the other thing that we've seen in the last few months is a total cacophony where every country has been responding on its own, in its own way, at its own pace to, to, to the crisis, even within Europe. And so the other question is whether cooperation between countries will be strengthened and be it at the regional, let's say European, or at the global level uh, to avoid that type of cacophony. And there, I would say, I don't know. It will depend on whether we can come back to multilateral dialogue, which is not the case now. And the question to me is whether uh, geopolitics will take over what we call uh, from health what uh, diplomacy. And at this time, the geopolitics uh, are not helpful and they have taken over the whole debate. Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, coming from Hilda Stevens uh, for Helene. Um, Helene, the question is, um, according to you, who should take the lead in the early negotiation at the international level and on the framework um, and measures needed for sharing? So who, Gavi, CEPI, TAP um, and governments worldwide? What, what do you think? Who should lead that? But it's a, it's a good question. I, th I think the, the leading agency in the world to, to set the norms is, of course, the World Health Organization. Um, it's not the Gates Foundation, it's not SAPI, and it's not Gavi. The norms should be set by the World Health Organization, and those agencies should then work towards, uh, to, towards achieving those. Um, I think strengthening the WHO will be very important. I think in, in, in some of the post-pandemic post uh, or post-most severe pandemic uh, phase, I'm sure that that will also, that will also be on the table. Um, how can we make sure that, that the WHO um, can, can play that leading role? In the last few decades, we've seen this sort of the weakening of the WHO as the leading agency. We've seen a lot of new partnerships emerge, new funding mechanisms emerge, uh, new players on the scene, and that has somewhat diluted um, the, um, uh, the the global health leadership role of the uh, of the of the UN. Um, the now on at, on the practical level, who negotiates? It depends a bit on what what you negotiate. For example, if you need to open negotiations on patent licensing, I would say we have the medicines patent pool for that. We don't need to create new mechanisms or new, new entities to do that. They're very good at that. They should do that. And they are already committed to play that role within the uh, within that framework but they've also been very clear at saying but under the umbrella of the WHO they should be um, the, that agency should be should be in the in the lead. Uh, CTAP will have to take up uh, a lot of the lot of the talks that will need to happen uh, with regard to the licensing of uh, of other technologies and of, of and, and of making sure that that data um, clinical trial data know how etc becomes. Uh, available. We also need a, a greater drive for transparency. It's, it is an issue that a lot of deals are being made uh, currently that of which you can't really know the details and there's a bit of a bit of a, an atmosphere of trust us will we'll do the right thing for you um, but uh, the right thing often does not happen if there isn't greater transparency so that would be another important theme I think we need to pay more attention to. Thank you, Lynn. Michel Goldman, uh, the conclusion, what do you think in three conferences, what uh, have be, uh, has been made? We have learned so much. Uh, I think now we are also ready to better understand what is coming in a few months. Uh, what will we do? A, a fourth conference? What do you think? <laughs> Perhaps, yes. I think <laughs> that what we learned today is that the challenges are really multiple. Very often people think, you know, a vaccine, that's a scientific problem. I think that now probably a number of scientific issues have already been solved. So obviously it's a question of money. 
we understand that the economic questions are important, political questions are important. But just to conclude, I would like to come back to how to build trust, how to make sure once we have those vaccines, efficient, safe, and accessible, how we make sure that all populations indeed adhere to the concept of vaccination, immunization. They understand that they protect themselves first, but that by taking a vaccine, it's also an act of solidarity. And this is a complex challenge to address. It's a question of making people, um, you know, to develop this concept of health literacy and vaccine literacy in the population so that people understand what it means. And we think at I3H that we have to start this effort very early on, already at schools. And I think that in the months, years to come, this will be a huge challenge also for all of us. It's really to build this trust in our societies. And I think this is what our speakers try to do together nicely today. Maybe that's one of the first time, Michel, we can uh, protect as much the, the people we love. And, uh, and just uh, with using a mask, and uh, also with uh, having a vaccine, sometimes it can help, and it can help a lot, isn't it? Michelle. <laughs> I've lost Michelle, I'm sorry. So I think he, he would agree. Uh, you so, <laughs> yes, you did, <laughs> but I couldn't hear you. Um, so it is time, you understood to uh, wish you a very, very nice, very relaxing and quiet vacation. I think we all deserved it uh, this year. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for attending the I3H video conferences. Uh, we would also like to thank all the speakers who attended despite their artwork. Once again, I would like to congratulate Mathias Watripon and Michel Goldman for the energy, for their determination in confirming I3H information mission in this uh, time of pandemic. There are also people that you don't see in this, uh, during these video conferences, but they are so helpful. They are just like, uh, uh, they are magic, actually. Uh, I, I would like to uh, thank Anya uh, Wozniak. I would like to thank uh, Caroline also, and I would like to thank Hilda, uh, who helped us so much uh, during uh, all the time of the lockdown. And now also, um, as you know, all this uh, has been uh, possible thanks to I3H sponsors. And in this case, uh, Dell and Private Bank. Uh, if you want to follow uh, I3H and if you want to support, maybe financially I3H, you can join I3H website and uh, social medias. Wherever you are, please be careful, stay healthy. I3H will be back in a few weeks with probably new developments. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>